Well, hello, uh, Chama, and anyone else watching this for the recording. We are about to begin lecture number 93, studying the guide for the perplexed. We are in book three, chapter eight. We started chapter eight um, on page 431 in the Shlomo Pines edition. Um, we're actually up to the top of page 432 uh, at the long paragraph that starts in this respect. The ranks of the Adamites differ. So just a, a reminder of what he said until now. Um, he talked about the Aristotelian idea of, ma of matter versus form. And if we remember that in those days, uh, they understood uh, the matter as being composed of four elements, you know, earth, water, wind, and fire. So if that's the case, what makes it that, why when you look at one thing, does it have one form? You know, look at a, a table or a tree, it looks like a table or a tree, and you look at the next thing, it's a rock or a um, pile of dirt. So the idea that they had was that there was uh, something called the form, the, the tsura, which gave that matter its shape. Now that form is, is, <clears throat> is what, what we may call today and we'll see as, as the, the spiritual component. This was the, the kind of the key, how Rambam and uh, Aristotelians understood the, the marriage between um, that which is spiritual, that which is coming from uh, on high, and that which is what we see as physical. The terms aren't exactly the ones that they would have used because they're using the terms matter versus form. And uh, so that if we and the Ramam just explained to us that the matter itself is constantly um, uh, is is completely physical. So all the physical desires that we have, all of the uh, negative traits that we have, uh, the selfish desires that we have, those are all matter. And it's the form which is which is what we perceive in our intellect, which we're supposed to use that form to perfect. Um, uh, the the matter. So Garmam is going to continue on this, and he's going to use this to give us ethical advice. So uh, I'm gonna, starting from in this respect, the ranks of the Adamites differ. There's different types of people, right? In the respect that we 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 gain control over matter with our form, there's different kinds of people. Among men, there are individuals who aspire always to prefer that which is most noble and seek a state of perpetual permanence, according to that what is required by their noble form. So th those people uh, are always always looking to try to be better. They're always looking to try to live according to the form, according to the form that makes a human being special, that makes us something uh, uh, good, something to be uh, 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 proud of. They only reflect on the mental representation of an intell intelligible. So when they see something, they think, what is the right way? How, how am I supposed to see this? What am I supposed to learn from this? How am I supposed to understand this? It's all about the, the cog, uh, cognizing um, the, the, uh, the, the situation as opposed to um, or, or the thing which the person is thinking about. Um, so uh, and always on the grasp of a true opinion regarding everything. They always want to understand everything according to its truth, according to the way it really is. And a union and on union with a divine intellect. And remember that form and this intellect, all uh, as you go up in the stages, they go up to the spheres and they end up being coming from God himself, which was we called, you know, through the active intellect. We explained this in the Ramam several times until now. So this is kind of almost like a connection from God all the way coming back down to the other direction, each sphere to the next sphere to the next sphere, all the way down to us, into our minds, into our intellect. Whenever the impulses of matter impel such an individual towards the dirt and the generally admitted shame inherent in matter, and this is an interesting um, uh, uh, observation, which I think it, we, even though we don't speak in these terms today, but, but it's still something that we can uh, uh, identify with. So if, if, um, if a person is being pushed towards one of these matters that are, if a person is being pushed towards the, um, towards the dirt, right? Towards those physical qualities, which are not good, which are not right. He feels pain because of entanglement. He's ashamed and abashed because of what he has gone through. So if he goes ahead, in other words, and makes a mistake, he feels bad about it, right? So the Ramam is, is telling us that, you know, a person who's living properly, 
is someone who will feel bad about the things that he did does wrong. He desires to diminish this shame with all his power and to be preserved from it in every way. This reminds me a lot of the way that that the uh, polygraph, the lie detector test works, right? Uh, um, Leslie, we're on page 432 in the middle of the long paragraph, uh, uh, maybe about 10 lines down. The sentence ends in every way. Um, so, so, um, so you know the, the way a lie detector test works is 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 based on the idea that when a person is lying about something that he or she did, they feel bad about it, and you pick up on those little physiologic changes when someone has that feeling of guilt, anxiety, right? They feel bad. But a person who's a pure sociopath who really really doesn't feel bad, a person who thinks that everything he does is right, no matter what he does, he thinks it's it's all good because for you know because he's just a total sociopath right? He won't have any feeling of shame whatsoever, right? This is like the case of a man with whom the ruler had become angry. So um, I, I'm going to, uh, so, so I'm going to kind of paraphrase this next couple of lines here. Uh, so the, the, the Ramam tells us of a, of a parable of a, of a king gets mad at one of his subjects and he punishes him by telling him your job is to clean out all of the, the filth from the toilets, right? All the dirt. And you have to get in that tank and you get full of filth and feces and disgusting matter all by, you'll have to do that. So a person who has a self-honor, he'll be degraded by such a punishment. But the Ramam compares it, uh, the other person is a slave. We have, to, we have to understand the Ramam's mentality in the world that he lived in. A slave won't care, right? He doesn't have any such sense of self-respect, right? So, so it, of being involved in all this filth and this dirt. So there are this, if I, I just skip down to the state of the various classes of people is similar. There are among men individuals who, to whose mind all the impulses of matter are shameful and ugly things. Those impulses that matter, that our bodies want to make us do, are shameful. They're ugly. They're deficiencies imposed by necessity, particularly so the sense of touch. Now, Aristotle understood the sense of touch to be what because which we we want to eat and drink and to copulate and and sexual desires right and that how, that's how aristotle understood comes from all of that comes from the sense of touch and all of that is physical stuff which we you shouldn't want right now remember i pointed out that there's a lot of other uh ethical and moral ways to understand uh um uh how to act you know how to how to understand and comprehend the, the impulses that we have. The Rambam is understanding it in his way, which is very, very much based on Aristotle, right? And it's based on this idea that the Rambam started with, that we're made up of form and matter. Form is that spiritual part of us which comes from God, which gives us our special humanity. And matter is that which give, gives us the desires to do these kinds of things. And we need to stay as far away from matter as possible. Consequently, and this is the same advice that the secular uh, philosophers were giving at the same time, the secular Aristotelians and the Muslim Aristotelians and so on. So consequently, one's recourse to these things should be reduced to the extent to which this is possible. One should do them in secret, should feel sorrowful because one does them and not have spoken in discourse about them. In other words, yeah, so, so things like sex are things that are supposed to be in private. You're ashamed about it. You don't talk about it. They're not the kind of things you announce in public. Right, a man should be in control of all these impulses, restrict his efforts in relation to them, and admit only that which is indispensable. You have to do so, to some degree, fine, but that's it. Otherwise, you stay away from it. He should take as his end that which is the end of the man qua man. Right, his purpose is that which makes me special, a human, different from all other matter. All other matter. If I don't have that special human quality, then I'm just like every other hunk of stuff, right, that exists on this planet. He should take um, so solely the mental rep. And what makes us special, what makes us a human being is that we can understand, we can see, we can we have wisdom, we have intelligence. The mental representation of the intelligibles, the most certain and noblest of which being the apprehension is, is understanding, is when we apprehend and we understand an idea. And as far as this is possible, to the extent that we can understand the understandings that we can gain of the deity of the angels and of his other works. Remember, this is coming on the heels of Rambam telling us about Yechezkel, Ezekiel's vision, right? And he, he's going, you know, all this, he's speaking this entire chapter that we're reading because he wants us to understand that that vision was the, uh, was, so to speak, the attempt 
of Yechezkel to, to apprehend, to understand the things that we can't understand, and so, which he described then in terms that human beings can, can use. These individuals are those, so these kinds of people are the kind who are permanently with God. These are to whom it is said when it says uh, in Tehillim, for example, I have said, you guys, you people are like, are like gods, right? And, and you are all uh, great and lofty children of the Most High. That, is, that was what he was saying at the time. Um, that was what um, uh, D- D- David, David was saying in the Psalms, right? This is what is required of man. I mean, to say this is, and David wasn't saying that human beings are angels. He was saying that human beings are like angels because, because we use that special quality, that special quality, which he's calling the tzura, the form, right? Which comes from God. And we already described many times how that process takes place according to um, uh, uh, the, the Aristotelians and according to Maimonides. As far as the others are concerned, those who are separated from God by, by a veil, being the multitude of the ignorant, the opposite is true. Those people that don't try to pierce that veil, so to speak, that don't try to gain true understanding of things as they are, right? They are, which is most of the people walking around this planet, it's the opposite. They refrain from all thought and perception about any intelligible thing. They don't use their mind. They don't use their intelligence, right? But rather, they take as their end the sense that is our greatest shame. I mean, the sense of touch. They involve themselves and indulge themselves in the pleasures of this world. And that's what they seek. And that's all they think about. Accordingly, they have no thought and no perception, except only in relation to eating and copulation. All they can think about is, is eating and enjoying food and sex, right? As has been stated clearly with regard to those these wretched people uh, wholly given over to eating, drinking, and copulating. It says, uh, uh, and he brings some some uh, various verses from the prophets, and you could you could read them. And it also says, and women rule over him, right? Meaning that's uh, from from Yeshayahu, right? This being contrary to what was required of them in the beginning of creation. You're supposed to be. Uh, uh, and here, I, and I know this is this this doesn't sound very good in contemporary uh, society speaking this way, but uh, the husband is supposed to rule over the woman as opposed to the other way around. How is the Ramam understanding that? The Ramam understands the 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 woman representing his desires, right? And he is supposed to rule over that desire as opposed to that desire cause him to do uh, and and things that he shouldn't do. In other words, he shouldn't be ruled by his desire. Rather, his desire he should rule over his desire. It also describes the violence of their desire, you know, with the, the violence that's associated with, with letting this desire run run amok, right? Everyone nayeth after his neighbor's wife and, and the ensuing, if you go through that chapter in Jeremiah, you see how that just leads to, 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 to violence and, and murder and, and all kinds of not such wonderful things uh, and so on. And he brings another verse for all adulterers and so on. For this reason, Solomon has devoted the whole of Proverbs to warnings against fornication and intoxicating drink because because uh, uh, you know um, the sexual impropriety and and alcohol are very closely related which is something we know to this day to be quite true for those who are the objects of divine wrath and who are remote from god are plunged deeply into these two vices of them it is said for they are not the lord's cast them out of my sight and let them go forth and so on um so the the um uh so again the point being right that we're supposed to uh, our goal is to allow, is to nurture that part of us which makes us special, which makes us human, and that is our intellect, our ability to to apprehend, to understand, and thereby come close to understanding God. And this, you know, is a theme that has repeated itself numerous times in this book. As for Solomon's dictum, this is a famous Eshet Chayil, which we sing on Friday night. Eshet Chayil Miimsa, who a woman of virtue, who can find? And and this whole parable, it is clear what this means. Now, what is it, what is the Ramam saying here, right? Um, well, why, what is so special about Eshet Chayil? So um, I'll describe. He's gonna. He's about to describe describe this. So um, uh, for it, it so happens that the matter of a man is excellent and suitable, neither dominating nor corrupting his constitution. That matter is a divine gift. In other words, it is easy, as we have mentioned, to control suitable matter. I, I mean, let me paraphrase what he just said, right? If, if yours form, remember, all matter, there's matter running around the world. There's tons of matter in this world. Each b- bunch of matter has a form that makes it what it is. And that form 
it's kind of like the spiritual force that comes from on high that says, okay, you're going to be a, a cow, you're going to be a cat, and you're going to be a human being, and you're going to be a tree, right? That form is residing in that matter, giving it its form. Now, if the form within, if, if the matter within which that form is residing is perfect, it's the perfect kind of matter, it's exactly the kind of matter you need to be a tree, so then that, that form, it's very easy for that form to make the tree into a tree, right? But sometimes you have to give somebody, but, but human beings, and I'm, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself, so I'll understand what he's about to say, is actually we're not put into matter that's perfectly suited to be a human being. We're put into matter that's, that's the lowliest junk. It's dirt, right? And we're, our form is in this dirt so that there is this tension, right? Because if it was easy, that Raman would say would be a gift. If that matter was perfectly suitable to be a human being, meaning the human being that thinks, that's logical, that's intellectually um, rigorous, and so on, it would be easy. But if it's, but even if it is unsuitable, and I added the word even just for for effect, uh, it is not impossible for someone trained to call it. Even if we land in matter that isn't perfectly suitable to be a human being because it has those desires, the, the anger, the, the lust, and so on and so forth, it's still possible to control it, which is our job, of course. For this reason, Shlomo, both he and others inculcated all these exhortations. That's the purpose of those parts of the Torah. Ramam is referring to Mishle here of telling us you got to behave yourself. You have to, you have to watch out for, and so on and so forth. Also, the commandments and the prohibitions of the law. And as the, this is a lead in also to what the Ramam is going to be talking about for a good part of part three. The reason for the Torah, right, is in order to help us control that matter. He's laying down the groundwork for us to understand the rest of what he's going to say. In addition to explaining a, a little bit more of what he just said about the Masi Merkava, about Ezekiel's visions. Also, the commandments are also, okay. It behooves him who prefers to be a human being in truth, if you really want to be a human being, right? Not a beast having the shape and configuration of a human being, right? Not just some sort of an animal that happens to look human. To endeavor to diminish all the impulses of matter, such as eating, drinking, copulation, anger, and all the habits consequent upon desire and anger. To be ashamed of them and set for them limits in his soul. You need to control those things. With regard to what is indispensable, the things you need to have, like eating and drinking, he must confine himself to what is most useful and to what corresponds to the need for nourishment, not to pleasure. He must also reduce speech about and gatherings for such matters. Um, uh, you know how the sages disliked meals that are partaken of uh, uh, with the view to a commandment. In other words, uh, the meals that people get together just for party's sake, not not for Shabbos or Yom for some holy purpose. Um uh, someone once asked Pilchas ben to eat at his house, but he didn't do it. I'm not coming over just as a friend, because all that, you know. So the Ramam is saying, put limits on these kinds of things. What is true of eating applies to drinking, as far as their purpose is concerned. And then he has a special thing to say about intoxicants, which um, which I think is, is interesting to hear. As for gatherings with a view to drinking intoxicants, right, you should regard them as more shameful than the gatherings of naked people with uncovered private parts who excrete in daylight sitting together. Drinking is worse than, than parties of people naked and doing all kinds of things that like that, right? Why is that? Why is drinking worse? Because in truth, excreting explanation is a necessary thing men cannot refrain from by any device whatsoever. People have to, 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 to have a bowel movement. Whereas being drunk is an act committed by a bad man and virtuous free choice. We don't need alcohol to live, right? So drinking is something that's not necessary. You're pushing it on top of yourself, right? The things, the things that we do as human beings aren't dirty in and of themselves. The disapproval of the uncovering of private parts is a generally accepted opinion. The fact that we don't walk around naked is because that's what people accept. People accept that it's not right to walk around naked. But there's nothing act. Not being thing cognized by the intellect. Intellectually, there's no reason why people shouldn't walk around without clothes, right? There's nothing dirty about our bodies. Our bodies are our bodies. That's just the way we are. We could walk around like that. We don't because a society doesn't accept it that way. But intellectually, there's no real reason. But drinking is completely not natural, completely unnecessary. Whereas the corruption of the intellect and the body is shunned by the intellect. Corrupting your brain, in other words, drinking alcohol so you can't think straight, is against everything that human beings stand for. For this reason, one who prefers to be a human being ought to shun it and not to speak of it. Stay away from alcohol. 
Now, this reminds me of an interesting uh, uh, a debate that that I, I heard a couple lectures on. I'm not an expert in the subject, but 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 there, if in the most recent, if there's someone here that's in the uh, uh, that's in a mental health field, they may, may know better than me about this stuff. But but in the last DSM, right, uh, the manual which lists all of the the um, behavioral health and mental health uh, illnesses and how to diagnose them and so on. Um, so it, it, the, the, they took out the idea of a sexual addiction, right? There's no such thing as a sexual addiction anymore. It's not an actual diagnosis. But alcohol addiction or substance addiction there is. And the, the reasoning, from what I understand from the lectures that I heard, is, is what we're saying, right? Because it, 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 there's a difference. Sex is something which is, it, it's not inherently, it's part of the human experience. It's part of what we do as human beings. It's part of our lives, right? Whereas to be addicted for some, it means taking a substance that you don't need from the outside and then becoming addicted to it. They're two totally different things. However, Ramam, of course, did just tell us before to stay away even from the usual pleasures because you're diving too much into the matter and you're not and you're and you're not concentrating on what makes you special as a human being. With regard to copulation, I need not add anything to what I have already said in my commentary. And Avos series talking about the Shmona Prakim, the eight chapters, and Avos about the aversion in which it is held by what occurs at a wise and pure law, and and about the prohibition against talking about it, and mentioning it, and saying it anyway. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little. The 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 Chazal tell us that Elisha was called a, a, a saint because he never thought about these matters. And Yaakov never even had a, a seminal emission. He never he never ejaculated before he had his first relationship with Leah, his wife, and had Ruvain. All these things are transmitted in order to make its members acquire human habits. So people should understand that you're supposed to control these things and not be controlled by them. And also what they what they say when it says that here hooray, right, Avera are worse than Avera. The thoughts about the sin is even worse than the sin itself. Now, why is that? So the Rambam has an interesting notion. Remember, according to the Rambam, the whole idea, the whole purpose of everything is for us to, uh, to purify and perfect our intellects, our minds, our intelligence, right? So if that's the case, I have a very extraordinary interpretation, Rambam says, which is as follows. A man committing an act of disobedience, if, if I were to go and eat, uh, eat a ham sandwich right now, right? So I, in the act of disobedience, or I decide to go and smack someone across the face, you know, who, you know, for, for no reason. So, or even for a reason, but not a good reason. So because of the accident's consequence upon the matter, right? I mean to say that he commits an act of disobedience through his bestiality. He, that's a, that man acting like an animal. He's using his body to do something like an animal does. But thought is one of the properties of a human being that are consequence upon his form. Thought is something that's related to our form, right? That should be perfect. That should be human. That's something that, that makes us specifically human, right? Consequently, if he gives his thought a free scope in respect to disobedience, right? In other words, he makes his thought disobedient, right? He commits an act of disobedience through the nobler of his two parts. Now, mind you, what this tells us, and, and this really drives home, is there there. There is a you, there is a self that's different from both the form and the matter. Don't confuse the one who's deciding what to do and how to do and whether to be good or bad is not the same as the form, right? In other words, you or I decide, right? We can decide, uh, but we, what we have to do is bring ourselves, whatever that self is, closer to the form and make us into what the form is influencing us as opposed to what the matter is, Right? But, but it's not one and the same. They're two separate entities, right? Now, the sin of him who does an injustice through making an ignorant slave serve him is not like the sin who, who, of him who makes a free man who is excellent serve him. Again, we have to um, forgive Rambam his, his, um, his medieval um, understanding here of the world divide, dividing, dividing people into slaves and free men, right? For the human form and the properties consequent upon it. But we do understand that, right? If you... If you have a person, you know, even now, even not a slave, someone who works for you and you tell them, you know, go clean up the, the living room, they'll go clean up the living room, right? If, if the, you know, if the, the state senator was in your house and you tell him to go clean up the living room or her to go clean up the living room, right? It, it, it's degrading. You don't do that. But, and if you do that, 
right? It's more degrading when you take the person who's on the higher level. So it's the same thing. If you, you've, you've corrupted even your form, if all you're doing is thinking about sin and thinking about bad things. If your mind is so selfish that all it thinks about is itself, I mean, think about the pure ultimate narcissist. Even his brain is the same selfish as matter. Is I know that wasn't very grammatically good, but whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, so uh, it wasn't, um, regardless, you know, even in his own mind, he's, he's, he's so low that, that, that his own intellect can only think about selfish things and how to gratify his own desires for the human form and properties consequent upon it ought only to be employed with a view to that which befits it, namely union with what is the highest, right? Not with a view to descending to the lowest degree. Now, uh, the Ramam then goes into talking about obscene language, which is interesting. I'm on page 35, the beginning of the second paragraph that starts, you know, which is, you know, the severe prohibition that obtains among us against obscene language. This also is necessary. For speaking with the tongue is one of the properties of human being and a benefit. This is something that we have that's special, that makes humans special, right? As it says, me some pel adam, who gave, right? And, you know, and so on. Um, the, the, now this benefit granted us with the view to perfection in order that we learn and teach should not be used with the view to the greatest deficiency and utter disgrace of speech was given to us in order to teach people, right. To learn from people, to ask questions so that we can communicate, we can make ourselves smarter, more intelligent and make ourselves better human beings. If you then go ahead and use that faculty of speech for the greatest deficiency and utter disgrace, Ramam says. So that one says what the ignorant and sinful Gentiles say in their songs and their stories. In other words, he's thinking about, you know, uh, um, uh, the sexually suggestive and lustful stories and poems and so on. Suitable for them, but not for those to whom it has been said, right, that you should be a mamlechas koan in the kadosh. God said that you should be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, right? Now, um, this is really interesting here because the Ramah is about to, uh, in the, the rest of this paragraph, we're going to learn something what the Ramam is trying to teach us, but we're also going to learn something very, very different about how the Ramam approaches the concept of holiness, right? What does it mean to be holy? I know this, it, uh, right? We just said you, we want the nation to be a holy nation. And the Ramam said that speaking of such vulgar matters, that's the opposite of a holy nation, okay? Now, what does it mean to be holy? Now, what do you think it means to be holy, right? If I tell you that that if I have the, a pair of tefillin or something or a Sefer Torah sitting on my table here next to me, and I told you that's holy, right? What does that mean? Does that mean that there's some kind of inherent quality to that Torah, right? Like like if I had a holimometer, right? I could I could that measures holiness. I could measure the the holiness of that object, right? Or if I say that person is holy, that if my holomometer would go all the way up if, if I put it next to that person. Or does it mean, right, it's holy because, because of, of, of something that we give to it as a human being. In other words, we, 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 we give to that a special um, prominence, right, because, because it teaches us something, because there's something special about it, because of the amount of work that went into making that, because of the, uh, because of what we learn from, because of what it re represents to us as a people, what it represents to the world, what it, the influence that it's had over us, the truth that's contained therein. But there's nothing inherent about that scroll that makes that that is different than any other scroll that has any other you know uh, 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 words written in it about anything. So. So the Ramam is about to give us a hint as to what he feels holiness is about. So hang in there. So, so a holy nation shouldn't be speaking such things. And whoever has applied his thought or his speech to some of the stories concerning that sense, which is a disgrace to us, right? If all you're thinking about is, you know, sexual matters is what he's saying here. So that he thought more about drink or copulation than is needful or recited songs about these matters. All he's doing is singing about these things and has made use of the benefit granted to him. And then he's made use of that, that faculty of speech. He's singing about not nice things, applying and utilizing it to commit an act of disobedience with regard to him who has granted the benefit and to transgress his order. So instead of using that to his benefit, like God gave it to him, right? We just said, me some pell who has given man speech, but God, 
right? And he's using that faculty of speech to talk about and, 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 and enjoy things that God told him not to, right? He is like those of whom it is said, and I multiplied unto her silver and gold, right? I gave them gold and silver, and they ended up using the gold and silver. Instead of worshiping me, they went and gave it to the Baal, to the, to the idol. I can also give the reason. So now, so, 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 so this, it, it's just terrible to use this special faculty of speech. So remember, Ramam said, if we use our minds and we're thinking and we've turned ourselves into kinds of people that even our thoughts are evil, that's like the worst uh, thing that we can do. And, and then he goes on to talk about speech, right? To take speech, which is such a holy thing, and use it for vulgar purposes is such a terrible thing to do. And now it's a slight tangent. Um, I can also give you the reason why our language is called the holy language. Why is Hebrew called Lashon HaKodesh, the holy language? Now, is it holy because it's inherently holier than other 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 languages? Is it holier than English or, or French or Spanish or whatever, right? Um it should be. It should not be thought that this is, on our part, an empty appellation. Now, interestingly, Rav Kapach, right, whose Hebrew translation I, I read all the time, he calls this hitpa'arut mitzidenu, which means it's not us bragging, right, about how great we are when we call our language the Hebrew language. How that this very dramatically different translation of the Arabic, empty appellation to hitpa'arut mitzidenu, I don't, I don't know, and I don't know how to read Arabic, and I didn't have enough time to research which one of these. I'd be interested to see what these newer translations, which went back to the Arabic to translate what they say. But I like Rav Kapach. It's not us bragging about how wonderful Hebrew is because it's the greatest, holiest language. That's not what it is. It's not what it means. In other words, we're not saying that it's inherently better than other languages, right? That's the bottom line. Or a mistake. And, it, or, and it's also not some kind of mistake. Like, in other words, what, it's a bunch of baloney, right? Yeah, Hebrew is no better than any other language. It's language that other language is also language. In fact, it is indicative of true reality. It's called the Shona Kodesh because of an actual fact that is a fact about the Hebrew language. And what is that fact? It, that makes it actually different from the other languages. What is that? For in this holy language, no word at all has been laid down in order to designate either the male or the female organ of copulation. There's no words. For, for 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 the male and female genitals. Nor are there words designating the act. There's no word for, for the act of the sexual act itself that brings about generation. The sperm, the urine, the excrement. There's no words for sperm. There's no words for urine. There's no words for excrement. It, it doesn't exist. No word at all designated according to its first meaning. Remember, Raman told us a lot about hot words. In other words, no word that actually means that. There are words that are used to refer to that, which he's about to talk about, right? But those words actually mean something else. And because of, of a borrowed use, they can be used to describe those body parts when it's necessary. How do, what do I mean? Um, these being signified by terms used in a figurative sense and by allusions is intended thereby to indicate that the, the reason why the language was designed this way, in other words, the Ramah acknowledges that Lashon Kodesh is a human-made thing but it was designed to be holy, right? As opposed to those that would call Hebrew, you know, the language with which God created the world. The Ramam is, is, is arguing on that, right? He's not, he's not agreeing with that, that, that whole mode of thought, that mystical mode of thought, which you'll find a lot in the words world of Kabbalah, right? He says um, it was simply because the language was designed in order to be holy, right? In order to teach us that those are the kinds of things that we shouldn't be talking about. We should be kind of putting to the side, talking about it only when necessary in the ways that are necessary. I'm turning the page to 436. It ought to be silent. However, when necessity impels mentioning them, a device should be found to do it by means of expressions deriving from other words. Just as uh, the most diligent endeavor should be made to be hidden when necessity impels doing these things. So when one is do, having sex, it should be in private, not in public, right? The male organ they have called the gid, right? Because it's called a gid, which means a sinew, because of what it looks like, right? Or, um, or they also call it shafcha, like when it says in the Torah, krus shafcha, where the instrument for pouring out. The, the, that word comes from lishpoch, shafach, shin fechaf, which means to pour. So it's the organ that pours, right? Because it's used for urinating. The female organ is called a kevata, right? Which is means her stomach, right? Keva usually means a stomach. And or the word rechem is actually the word that means the womb, right? But it can also sometimes be referring to other female genitalia, right? So in other words, they're using other words, right? And even the word for excrement is tsoa, 
So I just means the stuff that comes out, right? It ends up in Hebrew meaning excrement because there's no other word. So we use the stuff that comes out as the word in Hebrew. Um, uh, Meiraglaim, it's waters of the feet, right? Is or shifchat zera, you know, the seed that pours out, right? It's again the the um, uh, that's the semen. So the act itself also doesn't have. Whenever it talks about the act of of, of sexual intercourse, it refers to yishkav or yivaal. He 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 lies or or or, or yikach. He takes or yigala erva and covers the nakedness and so on. Now, now, automatically, those that are familiar with Hebrew will be thinking, "What about shegel, right? Shin gimel lamed, which is, which is usually translated as as the as sex, right? The act of sex." So the Raman says, "No, don't think uh, uh, yishgal. It don't think that that that's a mistake. The word shegel, actual meaning, is a reference for a female slave. And since in those days, that's what people did with their female slaves. Uh, again, I, I with our more modern sensibilities, these things are difficult to read, but we have to back up a thousand years, right? So the word shegel ended up is being borrowed to use for sex, even though that's not what it actually means, um, right? Yishkalena, right, uh, it does not mean, it, 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 it means make her into a slave, okay? In the greater part of the chapter, Ramam says, and I'm reading the last thing, we have turned aside, okay, wait, wait, before I read this last few lines of this chapter, I want to make a point, right? And this point is this one is what's really important about this, because what the Ramam just told us about Lashon Hakodesh. Why is it Kodesh? Now, whether or not you like his explanation, okay, we can discuss. Okay, we can we can argue or if, if we want to, or whether we like his explanation. But the key point here is that what makes Hebrew holy is not some inherent holiness to the language. In other words, if somebody tells you, "I'm using these words," I have to say this prayer in Hebrew because Hebrew has a special holiness. That's going to make things happen. If I say it in Hebrew, this thing is going to happen. Or if I use this Hebrew incantation, if I say it in Hebrew, because Hebrew is the holy language, according to the Rambam, that makes no sense. It's complete nonsense, right? Because there's nothing inherently holy about Hebrew, right? The reason why Hebrew is called holy is because of a, a fact about the language. The way the language is constructed makes it holy. And this is how the Rambam understands all holiness. Right, there's something about the way it was constructed by human by people that makes something holy. So, if you or I say that a synagogue is holy, is there some kind? If will my holomometer beep like a level ten if I walk in? But if I go outside, it'll only beep a level two. No, that's not what it means. There's no holiness that inherent in the synagogue. It's holy because people got together, raised funds, the community put funds together to put a building together, to make a place where we gather together to pray, to, 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 to encourage each other to be better people and so on, and to learn and to study and to, and to have you know, community events and things like that. So, so it's holy because of what we did to make that building. And we said, this building is appropriate for appropriate things and so on and so forth. Everything that's holy is a, holy because of of what uh, of of its function because of how it came to be because of what people made happen to to that thing what the holy land is holy not because there's some special holiness not like you're going to this land is better than that land you know but rather it's holy because because of of what it represents to our, to our history what we've done there what we've how we've lived there all the events that happened there all of the, the deeds that were done, the studying that happened, the teaching that happened, the work that happened, the blood and guts and tears that were spilled over the land, that's what makes it holy, right? And 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 this is where the Ramam here, when he's referring to specifically, he's only talking about Lashon HaKodesh, you'll find when he discusses holiness anywhere else that it that it matches up with what the idea that he says here. And this is brought, a lot of scholars use reference this particular chap, paragraph when we just talked about which we just read together when they discussed the subject of holiness and how Rambam understands the subject of holiness and what holiness is. I'm going to, I'll read just the last few lines. In the greater part of the chapter, we turned aside from the purpose of the treatise. We went away from our philosophical endeavors to deal with moral and religious matters. I started talking about moral and religious matters, how to be a moral person, how to be a better person. However, though these matters do not wholly belong to the purpose of the treatise, the order of the discourse has led to that. I just, because of what we're talking about, <coughs> I had to talk about it. And I just want to mention, why is it? What, is, what led him to need to talk about this here? 
Well, first of all, we'll understand it a little more as we continue. But I want you to understand, remember, he started off talking about the Masse Merkava, those visions that Yechezkel had, right? And, 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 and the Ramam wanted to remind us, right, of this, of the form and the matter, the, the form which comes ultimately from God, right? And brings form to the matter, which is the physicality of this world, right? And that there's, there's um, so that in other words, there's a connection between us and going all the way back to God, which comes through our form, which the Ramam des designated and explained to us is, his, is the intellect, right? So, um, and that that intellect, right, the goal of that intellect is to achieve understanding of truth to the best of our ability, which we cannot really comprehend, which can get, and that is the vision of Ezekiel, where he was getting as close to seeing God as possible, but still only able to characterize God in, in with terms that we can, we can get and we can understand. So Ezekiel told us about the, the wheels, the galgalim, the spheres. He told us about the parts of the world that, that are physical, right? And then he talked about the God that's all the way up on high, which is surrounded by that cloud, right? And, and Ram is going to talk about this in the next chapter, but I'm telling you this uh, deliberately so that we understand why this is an important transition. It's that conflict and, and also that confluence between the form that flows down into the matter. And we have to kind of, try to move the needle in the direction of form, in the direction of, uh, of knowledge and the direction of wisdom towards God, as opposed to in the direction of matter, the direction of sin, the direction of things that, that, that are, 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 are too much phys physicality. And that's, that's why this chapter is an important bridge, right? To get this entire, this process, which is really the struggle, according to Rama, the struggle of our lives. And, and again, I know I said this a few times, but I really want to point this out. This is very different. And I myself am a little conflicted because there's certain parts of the mystical approach which have gained much more traction in more recent centuries, which I like better, and certain parts which I don't. The one part that I do is the idea, the Ramam looks at it as this conflict, right? Right, But there is a flow, there is an attachment, but there's also a conflict. There's this physical versus, I'm going to use the word spiritual, even though the Ramam doesn't do that. He used Homer and Sura, right? The, 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 the mystics, the Kabbalists don't understand it that way, right? They look at everything as coming from God, right? It's all coming from God. And it's our goal to channel it in the right direction. So that mish like sex, for example, is not a bad thing that we have to stay away from, like Ramam just described, but rather it's, 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 it's a good force that we have to channel in the right direction rather than in the wrong direction. And it's and mysticism, especially through the Hasidic movement, pushed it in that direction, which is very different from the Ramam's approach. I'm only saying that, well, first of all, because I, I think it's interesting and important to know, and also so that you get the contrast. There's a very different moral approach being taken here. I'm going to try to not talk about that approach and try to focus on the Ramam's approach more, but but I, I did think it's important to point that out. So um, uh, we ho may have time to do the next chapter. Um, but let's open the floor for questions on this chapter first, if anyone has something they want to say. If there isn't, then um, let's go on to chapter nine. Okay, matter is a strong veil. And I gave you a heads up as to what this chapter is about. So you're going to hear what I, what I was telling you just before. Matter is like this veil preventing the apprehension of that which is separate from matter as it truly is. Right? It prevents us from apprehending and understanding that form right? that we're supposed to understand, how things really are. Like, like when we see a human being, right, we should be thinking about what's really human, which is his mind, his intellect, right? what makes him special. Right? It does this even if it is the noblest and purest matter. Any kind of matter, even the heavenly spheres, right, is some form of veil, some form of blockage that doesn't let us see what's beyond it. So even if we got all the way to the highest sphere, we, the, the veil might be a lot thinner. We might be able to see a lot more, but we still can't see behind it. There's still a, a block, right, between us and God remember, that we cannot pass. As human beings, as temporal beings, we cannot pass that. All the more this is true for the dark and turban matter that's ours. Remember, I mentioned that the human is made up of the junkiest stuff, the garbage of the garbage, right, right? So we for sure have a, this block that disables us from seeing beyond it or makes it extremely difficult. 
Hence, whenever our intellect aspires to apprehend the deity, if we want to apprehend and understand God or one of the intellects, or if we want to understand one of this, the intellects, meaning those powers and forces that control those intellects are those powers and forces. Remember, Ramam equated intellects with angels. Those are the powers and forces that make the world go around, that make things happen. So um, there subsists this great veil interposed between the two. This is alluded to in all the books of the prophets, namely that we are separated by a veil from God. He's hidden us by a heavy cloud, similar illusions, and so on. This is the intention of saying, Anon varof el sevivav, and that is in, in Psalms, we, if that sounds to me, there's clouds and darkness around them. And that intimates the fact that the, the obstacle consists in the tenebrous, I don't even know what tenebrous means. That's why we need the new um, translation, the words that uh, 60 years ago they might have known, but I don't. If someone can help me, please do so. But uh, consists in the tenebrous character of our substance and not in his, may be exalted. Being a body surrounded by mist or an enveloping cloud, so on. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. Moreover, this parable has been repeated, for it says he made darkness his hiding place. Similarly, when it speaks of his manifestation in a thick cloud, so on and so forth. For everything that is apprehended in a vision of prophecy, even when someone sees something in a prophecy, right? He's not, um, he's not uh, uh, actually, even, in other words, even a prophecy, he's not seeing God. He's, he's describing it in a, par, in, a, in a term of a parable. He's described, because there's that block. I can't talk about God. I have to talk a parable about God, right? Remember, even in Ezekiel, when he was, visualizing God himself, he said it was the image of a man. And Ramam said it was demus. It was an appearance like, because I can't see God. I have no idea what he looks like because I can't even describe it. I mean, he doesn't look like anything because he's God, right? So, so, but he needed uh, something to, a parable. So he used that parable of a human. And Ramam explained to us the reason why is because of our intellect. And our intellect does emanate from God, right? And remember, the Ramam scientifically understood it that way. Aristotle scientifically understood it that way. Um, for everything that is apprehended, okay, in a vision. Um, and, and though that great assembly was greater than any vision of prophecy and beyond any analogy, it also indicated a notion, right? I referred to his manifestation, maybe it's in a thick cloud. If we remember the last verse in, the, in that Ezekiel, which we read together in the first chapter, he says, come like the rainbow, which is in the cloud, that is how he saw God. In other words, he saw it all also enveloped in a cloud, right? In this mist. Um, uh, for it draws attention to the reason why he said it, that everything was all in this cloud because he's trying to point out to us that the apprehension of his true reality is impossible because of the dark matter that encompasses us and not him, Right? There's a cloud that surrounds us, which doesn't allow us to see beyond to see him, right? Because uh, he is not a body. It is moreover well known and generally accepted in the religious community. Everyone knows that at Har Sinai, when every person had the highest apprehension of God that any humans have had, right? Right? It was also in clouds and rain, right? Why is that? Why? What is the point of the clouds? And the Rama is telling us the reason is, right? It, uh, um, it's to teach us that we can't actually really see God. That's not something that we can see. It's not something that 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 we can uh, actually relate to, um, and so on. Uh, and let me just read this last few sentences. This is also what is uh, an intended in the dictum: darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. Not that He may be exalted was encompassed by darkness. It's not God that's surrounded by darkness, because God is represented by the no God, by the shine. Right? Uh, God is this perpetual, dazzling light. But the darkness surrounds us and we can't see beyond it to see that shine because of the darkness that surrounds us. Because it says, as it says, and the earth did shine with his glory, as we see in Ezekiel um, uh, in many places. I quoted from the first chapter, Raman was quoting from the 30, 43rd chapter. So bottom line, uh, and I promise that we have a few minutes for questions, but the bottom line of chapter nine is that that the, the matter within which we live as temporal uh, human beings on this world disables us from seeing beyond a certain that veil because we're stuck in this matter we can't get beyond it we can we can we our job is to try to get as much as we can and to understand as much as we can but there's a certain point where there's this cloud that blocks us where we can't comprehend and beyond that is where god is and um that's the point of chapter nine uh so i'll stop here and open the floor go ahead
I see a hand up. <laughs> yeah. uh, to increase your vocabulary, tenebrous means dark and murky. Oh, all right. Murky. That works. All right. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to remember. I may remember now that we brought it up like this, but I, ca I can't Let's imagine see. myself using it in conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But thank you. That's definitely helpful. Um, <laughs> if there's, I don't know if there's anyone else has a, um, uh, anything to ask or mention on this chapter here, but um, as we move through this um, very, uh, we're, we're, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, it, it's there's, there's, there's a lot here. Um, I, I hope, I hope you guys found today helpful and um, next week. Oh, by the way, next week, um, like a 98% chance that I won't be giving the class. I'm going to, I'm kind of taking a week off next week to spend a week with my kids. So, um, so, uh, I doubt I'll be able to do this. So we're going to take, a, it'll be, it'll be my week summer break and then we'll pick up after that. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.